Good afternoon, everyone. Ani Boju. This is Holly T. Bird from Title Track, and I'm here with Courtney Wiggins, Tia Harrison, and Brianna De Moray from uh, some of the members of Northern Michigan's E3. Um, and we're going to start off um, first of all um, with a trigger warning. We want to um, ensure that, uh, especially our BIPOC people, and um, which stands for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, that there may be discussions here that, that can trigger you, that can trigger some, some trauma for you, that can trigger some emotions. Um, but even for our um, non-melanated relatives, uh, that could be the same. So uh, we're putting that warning out there and um, asking you to, to listen with an open mind and heart, but also be mindful that um, if, if this, uh, we don't want this to be a traumatizing space for anybody. So um, just putting that out here. And we're gonna start off with a land acknowledgement. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak some of that in the language um, Anishinaabe Moen, which is the original language of this land. So, Ani Boju, Shasko Wasakwe Nindishnakaz, Nimki Indorum, Traverse City Indonjaba, San Felipe Pueblo Indonjaba, uh, Northern Michigan E3 Nindonjaba, um, and miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. I'm so um, I'm so honored to be here today with E3, the members of E3. I'm um, honored to be here as part of Title Track as well as um, here at Harvest Gathering. And um, to start off our our session here um, with respect to understanding racial justice, we want to start by acknowledging uh, the ancestors of this land. Um, the people of this land, the, the original indigenous people of this land, um, where we all live. I spoke to you in the language of this land and I have um, I am not from here originally, my, my people are Pueblo, um, but I grew up in Michigan and I think it's important to learn the language where you are, um, which for me, the original language here is not English, it is Anishinaabe Moen. So um, out of respect for our ancestors here who are uplifting us, who are raising us, um, who struggled to survive and gave blood so that all of us could be here today. Um, that includes by blood, by treaty, um, by walking the land and by teaching us how to be and how to live. Um, I wanna respectfully ask for their guidance and acknowledge them today um, as being the people who've been here for thousands of years, who continue to live here and continue to teach us how to live um, as good people, Anishinaabe Moen, people lowered here in a good way. And um, Anishinaabe Kwe, um, Nindishnika, as I'm, I'm consider myself an Anishinaabe woman because I am indigenous and I live in this area, um, as do I consider the, the other women on the council here. So um, respectfully, um, giving thanks to them, giving thanks to the mother earth here that sustains us. And um, uh, just saying from my heart, miigwech, 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 he's uh, and, and most out of humility and respect. So with that, we'll start. And I think um, what, what we're gonna do today, um, even before we get started introducing ourselves is um, out of more respect, we wanna take a moment of silence. Um, for for all um, BIPOC, uh, LGBTQ, and others killed uh, through methods of oppression, racism, genocide, and prejudice, um, we live on a in a country that's founded on this, and um, all over the world these things happen. Even today, they're happening, and so we want to take a moment of silence for all of those people and all of those spirits um, that have been lost or have been taken um, through those methods. And if during that time, you could take a minute to center yourself and, and think of, of those collectively, those people. Um, there's so many names that we could say, everybody from George Floyd to Martin Luther King, to every indigenous person, all my relatives um, who came here or who have been here uh, women that have been killed through domestic violence or um, murdered as MMIW, um, members of our LGBT community that have been killed simply for being who they are. Um, we ask you to take a moment to, to wish them well 
on their journeys and to thank them for their sacrifices. And hopefully that as a collective consciousness, we can all move forward um, together and learn from these incidents so that their lives were not taken in vain. Thirty seconds isn't long enough, but from our hearts, we thank you and we honor you. And um, now, I'd like to introduce Courtney Wiggins, one of our co-directors um, of the Northern Michigan E3 Council, and we're going to do a, a short round of bios and head into some discussion. Hello, everybody. I'm Courtney Wiggins. I'm not originally from uh, Traverse City. I'm actually from Jackson, Michigan, um, which is a pretty diverse area for Michigan. Um, I've lived all over the place from Detroit, Chicago, Las Vegas, and in some rural communities like Parma, Michigan, um, up here in Frederick, Michigan, Kalkaska, and now I've landed here in Traverse. So I've walked many paths with people who share some very open-minded, diverse viewpoints to some very limited and very hard points of view. Um, my background is that I'm multiracial. My mother is white and my father was um, Native American and Black. I uh, identify as a Black woman. Um, but I do give honor to my full heritage. I have a young son um, and I'm a single parent here and a business owner. I'm very proud to be here in Traverse doing this work um, to make our community safe and welcoming, inclusive of all people. And with that, I will kick it over to Tia. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, my name is Tia Harrison. I am, um, all, I obviously I'm a member of E3, one of the members of E3. I am originally from Alpharetta, Georgia, which is about half an hour north of the city of Atlanta. I grew up there, uh, went through school, through college, uh, went to Florida to work for a little bit. And that is where I met my husband and um, ended up moving here. Um, so growing up in the South, uh, it's a little bit different as far as the blatant racism, but it's not anything new being up here <laughs> as it gets more and more. I joined this council for the very reason that um, this work is who I am. I've realized through the different blessings of COVID that um, this is where I need to funnel my, my energy and my anger about the unjust killing of our, our BIPOC relatives and brothers and sisters because it did not start with us as uh, Black people, um, but I hopefully it will end <laughs> with us and our Indigenous brothers and sisters and uh, other people of color. Uh, I have four children. I I'm a stay at home ish mom. And I also am an educator of dance. Uh, and with that, I will pass it to Brianna. Hello, I apologize. I'm working on my video versus having another window open I'm using a tablet. Um, my name is Brianna. I am also a member of E3. Uh, I have a bachelor degree in social work. And with that being said, Advocacy is, like Tia said, who she is, and um, I resonate with that. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to be invited here. Um, <clears throat> again, I apologize. 
I also, I have a cold, so I'm like <laughs> struggling to breathe here. Um, but realistically, this has started, this work has started long before me, long before my ancestors and like my other <laughs> uh, panel members here, I wanna acknowledge that. So it's like, I feel like we need to continue to, to acknowledge that and until it becomes a reality for everyone um, because without understanding of where we've come from, we're not able to move forward. And um, with that, I just wanna, yeah, say thank you again for being open to hearing from us. Thank you, Brianna. And I'm Holly Bird. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm a co-executive director from Title Track, um, as well as a local attorney. Um, I've got a history of advocacy within the Native American community, um, uh, working uh, with at Standing Rock with uh, Water Protectors Legal Collective, excuse me, um, working on issues of racial justice. Um, I'm a member of the Federal Task Force on uh, research for missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, <clears throat> and I've been uh, doing, I would say, advocacy work, activism for a long time, whether it was for the environment, uh, the water, um, for our Indigenous people, or um, for racial justice in general. And I'm so pleased and proud to, to be here um, today with my some of my council um, siblings, I call them. <laughs> and um, as a, as a resident of Northern Michigan, which I consider to be one of the most beautiful places on earth, um, really take to heart the, the, the task that, we, that we've undertaken, um, which is to um, try to eradicate racism and prejudice within our, within our community. Um, unfortunately, um, beautiful places don't always make uh, beautiful hearts. <laughs> And we, um, we've had to run into some of that um, here. Uh, I always like to say that uh, Traverse City is very diverse because um, when you start from a population of indigenous people and you add um, a lot of white people to it, it's become a diverse place. Um, but we also, um, as far as people of color, um, you know, it's, it's getting more diverse all the time. So these are issues that we really need to work on um, if we're gonna move forward as a, as a successful community. Um, and I'm sure that there's a lot of people that feel this way in their own communities, whether in Northern Michigan, um, Southern Michigan or beyond, um, the, uh, the issue of, of how do we move together? How do we progress as people and as a society um, has come to the forefront, you know, thanks very much to um, the actions and the, and the tears and the blood and the sweat of um, th those in the Black Lives Matter movement recently. Um, as Native people, we've been saying this stuff for years too, and uh, we're so happy that that voices are being elevated this way, and so happy to support. So, um, and through this work, um, I think that I've been lucky to be put in touch with so many wonderful um, heart-centered people who have the same goal in mind, and and some of them are on this call today. So, um, I. Uh, I want to uplift all my my brothers and sisters out there that are that are doing this work and those whose hearts we haven't touched yet because we're coming for you. <laughs> so, um, Tia, do you want to do you want to dive into the next uh, issue? Um, I think we're going to talk a little bit about who we are as far as the history of E three. Absolutely. And um, my fellow council women, if you if I'm missing anything, please feel free to unmic and help a sister out. Um, so we get this question a lot. What, how did, what, how did we get started? Um, we were originally um, the Northern Michigan Anti-Racism Task Force, but that got very mouthy and kind of clunky. So we've condensed ourselves to Northern Michigan E3. Um, the way like we, I guess our also our intros kind of can explain how we started this council was just all of our passions to to stand up for what's right and for ourselves and for our, and for our community. Um, 
I would say, so there were two protests and the, the one that I was a part of was the, the most recent, the last one, the June 6 protest where there was, I think two, over 2000 people that attended. But before that um, protest kicked off, there was um, one, Courtney help me out uh, in, it was right <laughs> after, sorry, go ahead. We had, uh, the first one was um, May 30th. And that yeah. came about within 24 hours. So we were, we're not playing game. We weren't playing games here, people. So, so once we, uh, after the June 6 protest, which was uh, amazing energy and um, accountability and, and even through a pandemic, people showed up to show that they were just like us over the racism and the unjustified killing of black, black bodies. So once that um, protest happened, we realized that there is obviously a need for this type of organization in Northern Michigan, just because um, people of color aren't visual every day does not mean that there isn't a need for that um, inclusiveness in the community, whether it's an education, business, um, social work, um, we need to be as, as involved and up to the table as anybody else. So um, that's basically how we got started with E3. And we're still, I would say, we're still solidifying ourselves and, and making our, our, our need for the community known within our own council so that we could better help the different calls that we have for action from other people as far as bringing this to someone's attention or talking about a racial slur that was spoken by a you know road commissioner um we have to, we get all those calls and embody them and figure out how we can best delegate and take and address the situation um i feel like that kind of explains it but we also have our, our facebook page right now that is our our way of communicating to our members at large. We're in the works of building a website as well, but our Facebook page, um, Northern Michigan E3 on Facebook is a great way to stay connected with us. Um, and then also emailing us if for some reason you can't get a hold of us on our Facebook, but that is our main way of how we get the word out for calls of action and how we let our, again, our community at large know what we have going on and what we need help with um, as a council. And if anybody wants to piggyback on that more, I would, I would love it. But if I, if I kind of got it all, not really. <laughs> um, I think you did a great job. I, I want to say that uh, we, I didn't meet any of you until I think Courtney, I met you out at the first protest, which initially that was me and Betsy Kofi <laughs> were like, we have to do something and mm -hmm. contacted each other. And I remember, um, I don't know if it was Elizabeth or Betsy that contacted you. And Courtney showed up in this amazing red dress. And um, we were all masked up and, and she just looked like revolutionary, you know, and we all got up on a, on a picnic table with um, some, uh, some loud, some speaker horns. A megaphone, our, yeah. Our megaphone, thank you. <laughs> and um, just let it rip, you know, and it was amazing. And it was, uh, we, were, we were surprised how many people mobilized that, that quickly. Um, and did so um, within the pandemic guidelines that we asked for. And then Absolutely. like the following weekend, we had the one of the biggest protests in Northern Michigan, which was, was wild. wild. And, and it so, should yeah. be noted that we did that with the cooperation of law enforcement. We actually had our law enforcement agencies show up and give a lot of positive support and also kept off some, um, some counter protesters that showed up. Absolutely. So it was, it was absolutely amazing. And then I don't think we've all stopped talking, you know, with the exception of maybe one or two days since then. <laughs> it's seriously like the protest is where I met all of you guys. And then it's been like full throttle. Like, I don't think we have slowed down. I mean, we, you know, we'll talk about this throughout the, the talk here, but of course, like the self-care is usually where we kind of go quiet, but I mean, every, any other time we it's, it's game on. 
<laughs> yeah. There's a lot to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I reached out to Betsy because I knew Betsy was, I, I have not been in Traverse City for very long. I've only been here for almost two years now, but I knew that Betsy was an activist and that she would know who, who to put me in contact to, to do something here. And she put me right in contact with you, Holly. And then it was, it was like game on, we're doing this. But isn't that also the beauty of being from a small area where like the, like this, was it the six degrees of separation where someone knows someone that's connected and that can help you. And that's the beauty of like being in community together, right? Like being able to call someone and be like, hey, I want to do this. And I saw that you were, you do this a lot too. Can you hook me up with, and cause that's how I messaged Elizabeth. And I was like, I saw that you were at the original protest. Like, how do I, how do I help? How do I get my voice out too? And then it was, I got in contact with Courtney and that was it. <laughs> so it was amazing. Um, I always say creator put us like in the right place together, you know, totally. like right place, right time there was a, there was this call out, you know, I always say if everybody's listening to their heart, you know, then we, we find each other, right? We find each other that to me, that happened with Standing Rock too. I always say we created a water clan there. We were all listening to mother earth calling out for our help. And um, the people that showed up were actually answering that call. So to me, kind of the same synergy, I've seen it happen time and time again. And I'm like, it's amazing. But yeah, we haven't stopped moving. And, and despite threats, you know, Courtney, um, during our second protest, I believe it was, um, had a truck threaten her, you know, on the way to the protest, like she was, the, it was pretending like it was going to run her over or threatening to run her over so much so that, you know, I made my, my husband drive her home um, so that she didn't have to be alone because he's a big guy. And would have kicked somebody's butt so but the fact is is that um you know we've all had to sort of ride this wave through these feelings of unsafety too um when we had someone in a town nearby that we thought you know that was firebombed um mm -hmm. how frightening that was or when we had like public officials elected public officials making racist comments or putting up statements supporting white supremacy yep um how frightening that's been and, and to be in this space together as creators of, of this movement in this town, in this, in this area, in this region. Um, it's funny because we all reach out for each other now and yeah. from being total strangers and um, it couldn't be a better bunch of people, honestly. <laughs> I'm so, I feel really blessed, you know. Absolutely. I hear that. I'll second that. And I also, think, um, the, oh, go, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, you know, like, I think too, part of the formation of the group is, is that there's this thought that racism doesn't exist up here because people have this misconception that there aren't any minorities, not any marginalized folks up here, but we are right. here. Right as Holly has said, like, we have indigenous people who've been here on the land for forever, guys, like, they're here, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, let's acknowledge that fact that like, racism happens here, land has been taken here. Um, our rights are not acknowledged here. And there's there's the subtle racism that happens here that people don't realize because they don't experience it. But as a person of color, we experience it. So it is real and it does exist. And that's why our group is here. Absolutely. Now more than ever, we have seen the need for E3 and, and of like organizations. Um, at the protests, and I'll kind of kick it back to you, Courtney, after at the protests, how we ended it was listing 10 demands for law enforcement. And I know demands can be like such an aggressive word, but it's meant to be aggressive. Um, and it's not just demands for our law enforcement, because again, 
they work for us. They are, their positions are elected. They are paid with taxpayer dollars. It's, it's a demand, but not only for our law enforcement, but for our community at large as well, for things to be thankful, to, to, to think about more and strive to be a more anti-racist community and more inclusive community. So if Courtney, you wanna kind of outline those demands, I'll kick it to you. All right, um, so I'll just go through them one by one and like everybody can jump in and say what they feel about it. So number one is ending profiling practices. And, and what that means is we want the city and county law enforcement officers to cease practicing practice of um, profiling response calls when citizens provide uh, profile our neighbors by calling police on someone who is breaking no laws, but simply because they think the person doesn't belong or they look suspicious or other codes that say that, you know, our, our BIPOC folks here are who, are who might be experiencing homelessness or mental illness or things like that. So we want those practices to end. Yeah, and, and specifically, we're talking about practices that are um, related to racial profiling, um, generalizations based on, on some the color of someone's skin or their look, um, or the fact that someone might think they're suspicious because they don't think they should be there in, a, in, a, in the context of, you don't look like me, right? Um, we see it happening here. We, we, it happens all the time. We had a friend, um, Cyrus, who is a doctor of Middle Eastern descent. I believe, is he from Iran? Iran or Iraq? Iran, okay. And, um, you know, a young, young doctor practicing in Northern Michigan, um, married, has a beautiful home um, in Northern Michigan and his neighbor's visiting mother called the police on him while he was walking in his own backyard. So um, this happens, you know, the police showed up and it was just based on what he looked like, <laughs> you know, despite the fact that he owned it, you know, he was, he was a homeowner and he, he's, he, uh, you know, was, uh, he even sounds 100% um, Midwestern accent because um, he grew up here. And um, if you talk to him on the phone, you'd, you'd never know him as anybody different than um, your brother or sister, you know, or brother, I guess it would be. But it does happen here. We know that it happens. We've gotten confirmation that it happens. Um, we've all experienced it. it. We've all experienced it. We've all experienced it. it. And it's hearing you describe it, Cyrus, it's like, when you think about the need for ending racial profiling, that's the end that we like, we shouldn't have, people shouldn't have to explain why or how they look should not be threatening or why they should be in this neighborhood. You, you know, like that's to me, that is how I've always, and a lot of this is like self-recognition and like healing and growing and realizing like how I have walks through my life trying not to offend people with how I look or how I or how I walk into the grocery store you know and we've talked about this Courtney and Brianna too like you go shopping you put your like your purses out front you you're on a mission you want to go in there like you like you're supposed to be shopping because you are you know like um you hold your receipt out when you get when you get when you pay for everything because I've been stopped and they haven't stopped anybody else, but they have to check my receipt. I'm like, well, why, why, why would you have to do that? So the, the need to, there should be not an explanation of why someone should be at their house just because they don't look like they should be in that neighborhood. What does that even mean? <laughs> you know, and to make a call like that and to have police respond and again, waste that mm -hmm. time that maybe could be used for like a life-threatening issue of someone that's, doing X, Y, Z, now you're going over and hassling someone for being in their own, on, a, on their own property. And that's how, that's how those situations, we've seen them time and time again on video, escalate 
to then someone losing their life. So that's my that's my TED talk about ending racial profiling. <laughs> well, and also to like to talk a little bit more about being in the grocery store, you know, like the things that we have to tell our children too. It's like you can't walk through the grocery store with your hands in your pocket because you're going to get, somebody's going to start following you because they think you've stolen something or they're mm-hmm. going to accuse you of putting something in your pocket. And we have to teach our children that. And uh, I mean, I'm sure other people do it too, but to the extent of like knowing that once we walk into the gro- grocery store, or any store, we're automatically drawing attention because of our skin. Right of how you look and then and then you're also on high alert like you're all you also feel like there have been times where I feel like I find myself rushing through the store so I can just get out but I have yeah. to like check myself and be like why are you doing that like no one else like people are leisurely walking with their carts and I'm trying to rip through aisles and granted I usually have four kids with me and I'm trying to get out because they're you know four kids but I find myself like going to get out because I just feel like I don't want to start anything. If I mean, it's just these thoughts that pop through your head, and it's definitely it's definitely traces back to me generational things. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother well, discussion. And, and two, like getting pulled over, you know, it's already a traumatic thing because you're getting pulled over. But mm-hmm. then also on top of that, the historical, you know, things go wrong when people of color get pulled over. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm always just gripping tightly onto the wheel thinking, God, please don't let this be a bad day. <laughs> let me right. just get through this, this traffic stop. I haven't had that happen a ton of times, mind you, but I've had it happen enough where it's traumatic to me. Right. You know, whenever I've gotten pulled over, like totally traumatic. Mm-hmm. And I, th- and I think too, you know, even aside from law enforcement, it happens just based on association. So, mm. you know, I've grown up in, in Traverse City since I was a teenager. Um, I would say I'm, I'm lighter than a lot of my other indigenous br- brothers and sisters. So like I can be white passing a lot of people just don't know. So they don't ask, but um, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a, an attorney and a Supreme Court judge. <laughs> My parents have built businesses here and, and in fact, you know, created children's garden and have always been somewhat known in town. But I've, I've been able to walk around for most of the time without um, being bothered too often. It happens once in a while. But here's a great example. Um, I've gone to Myers all of my life. You know, and usually I'm walking in there just kind of dressed casually, dressed um, in my business clothes, whatever it is, you know, maybe toting my children, looking like a mom, soccer mom. Um, but one of the times I walked in there and I was, I was wearing my, my indigenous bling, you know, I was wearing like clearly a ribbon skirt and some, some really nice, you know, earrings, um, beaded earrings. I had a, a Native American um like an indigenous activist shirt on. I think it was a water is life shirt. And um, it was the very first time I ever got stopped walking out of Myers. And it was hilarious because all I had in my cart was a piece, a single piece of furniture. And I had the, the ticket sitting in my hand, <laughs> like this, like the receipt sitting in my hand. And so, um, some guy stopped me and oh I gotta search your cart and I was like why you know I have one piece of (laughs) one thing in here you can see it clearly oh well you know and I said no I don't know and I you know I ended up calling and um making a complaint and management apologized um but their response was to send the guy to the powwow for the for the day to see if he would get some cultural um, teaching, which to me, the guy walked around, I saw him there, he walked around looking grumpy, and had no context and no clue as to why any of that mattered, right, or what he did and why that was offensive. So I, and I've heard countless stories like that, like, from friends that are, are just people of color that obviously don't look like, you know, that don't look white, 
you know, they just get stopped for whatever reason. And, um, and, and that shouldn't be, you know, or followed around the store for that matter. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening. Um, for, I thought mine was hilarious because I was like, oh, you just got to dress me up in the right clothes. And apparently then I become a person of suspicion. But, um, you know, for everybody else that doesn't matter how they look, that's, that's what we're talking about. So, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, here. So that's how we feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> So the next on our list is replacing replaced with ref, resource referrals. So instead of responding with an armed officer to such profiling calls, train police and 911 to screen and ask questions to point the citizen to homeless resource uh, outreach or CMH, or simply to reiterate that a person has a right to be on public street or sidewalk to exist in the community without being questioned or harassed. And as we've already just demonstrated, like we, we've all had issues of that where, you know, we're pointed out as not being in the right, in the right place because of our skin. Um, we've had incidents that showed that that happens. So anybody else want to ring in on that? All right, well, I will move on then to the third item. Establish anti-profiling oh. policy. Oh, did you have something else? I did, I'm sorry, I was typing. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm actually sharing all of our, our demands in the chat so that people out there can see them and use them if they need to. You know, we want everybody to be able to, to see what we're doing and um, hopefully do something similar in their own communities. Um, so what I wanted to say about that re resource referrals, you know, we've been meeting with local law enforcement every week um, to go over these demands and to, to ensure that things are getting done. And one of the, the biggest things that we've heard from them is that um, since funding's been cut for mental health services in Michigan, since um, apparently there's a, a lack of funding for uh, crisis intervention for uh, drug addiction and homeless people, um, that that they've become sort of the dumping ground for all of these societal issues, and the um, and that they're not trained. They're really not trained to deal with that. Um, they get some training, but you know, as we know policing and, and the culture of policing in America is one of a militarized response. It's not like back in the day when we had, um, you know, somebody's father walking the beat in our neighborhood and we all knew who that person was. The, um, the uh, it's much different now since, you know, back in the fifties or sixties when, when the idea of militarized policing was, um, introduced and, and established by the LAPD, um, police departments all over the United States have, have seen that as the most efficient and easiest way for them to, to do their jobs. Um, so when you get these sort of resource referral ideas, like people who, who have mental health needs, who have drug addiction needs, who are having homeless issues, um, and of course we know that a lot of those people have the same um, some of those some of those problems are all rolled into one or we have families that are in crisis you know a parent who's who's calling because their child's not listening um a militarized response is not the proper response to any of that um i was actually reading or watching something today from a former marine that said you know the military is a training ground for people who are who go to war who are made into um, sort of robotic killing machines. That's what they are. That's what the whole purpose of the military is. And um, so when you take that concept and you apply it to the police, which is supposed to be a peacekeeping force, right? Um, it, it doesn't jive with, with 
putting mixing that with society because per people's personal problems have nothing to do with war you know they have nothing to do with um the need for somebody to carry around a gun right so and, and that's not to say that um we don't need the police for for investigating crimes or from for preventing crime that's what they should be for but um, for all of these other things that they're being applied to in a militaristic fashion, um, we see what's happening. We see uh, people who are trying to commit suicide are being killed, you know, by police officers. We have people like George Floyd who supposedly had a bad check, you know, that got killed um, for simply being him. And it's ridiculously insane. I mean, it makes no sense at all. So, and, I, and that's not to say that all police officers are bad. That's not to say that all acts of, of the police are horrible because they're not. There's plenty of good things that officers do do. Um, but as far as how to deal with our problems in society as people, as civilians walking around as citizens, um, we don't need a militarized force. So that's where this particular aspect is really important. And I would love to invite um, Brianna, who is a social worker to, and an advocate for, for homeless people to talk on this a little bit because I think her insight is really important here. Okay, you can forgive me. What am I speaking on specifically? <laughs> I was trying to oh. find it in our... Yeah, no, no, no. We're talking about the resource referrals and the need for law enforcement um, to, it instead is. of showing up to these homeless situations, to drug addiction, to, you know, parents not being able to parent their children correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of coming up with this militaristic response, how they should be setting up resource referrals. Got it. Thank you. Okay. So resource referrals um, from a social work standpoint, um, it's kind of what social workers go to school for, um, academy and social workers go to, you know, these courses and, and workshops that literally trains them and prepares them to be in situations where law enforcement um, historically has shown up and that's been an issue. Um, first responders, there's a, I mean, I, I equate it to like, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I would not be the first on the scene to someone who was having a heart attack um, or someone who was bleeding out, something in that nature. Like, I know that that's not my expertise. I know that I don't have adequate training. And I feel like as a social worker to be able to say that, like, actually, I don't know what I'm doing in this area. That speaks volumes. And I feel like law enforcement, like getting to that point, working with law enforcement to be like, okay, we are not saying that you are not good at your job. At the same time, we're saying there are parts of your job that should never have been a part of your job to begin with, because social workers are notorious for knowing how to handle de-escalation. De-escalation with people who come from all different walks of life. Um, you know, if we're gonna get all realistic, like law enforcement enforce the law breakdown. Right there is no law that says that someone can't struggle with um, addiction or substance use. There's no law that says that, you know, kids in school can't have a rough day, that type of thing. There's no laws against that. Um, at the same time, that's how we've been approaching working with people. Um, and as a social worker, it's like, okay, if I'm literally going to school for this amount of time, going to this profession, and I'm gonna put this out there, getting paid at the rate that a social worker gets paid, you better believe that I wanna take on those roles and responsibilities. Like I've, I've seen, I'm not gonna lie, I've seen a lot in chats and in like comments and everything, like why would social, why would we like have social workers go out to these scenes? Like that doesn't sound safe. Like I would never wanna send a social worker out there. What are they gonna do? I'm gonna let you know that social workers are gonna do what they've been doing since day one. And it's showing up and doing their job because that's what you sign up for. Just like if you sign up to be in law enforcement, you show up, you go to work, you do what you're there to do. So it's like, there's a lot that social workers and law enforcement have in common. At the same time, why not 
like lighten the load a little bit, you know? Like, I'm not a parent, but as someone who's a former nanny, like delegation is huge. You know, like when you're working with kids, certain areas of risk, knowing what they can't handle. And also like looking at your, your roles and responsibilities and being like, okay, how can we make this so that I'm not so stressed at the end of the day? How can we make it so that we have more quality time? That type of thing. And I feel like law enforcement can really learn from that. Like take a stance of like, okay, what does this look like in my relationships? Like in my family, like how do we work as a team? Like how do we share that responsibility of making sure that everyone's taken care of, that everyone's needs are being met. And at the same time, like realistically, like I don't wanna get paid for nothing. So let me do my job. Yes. <laughs> well, the other thing that kind of popped in my head too, uh, when you were talking about that, Brianna, is, and when we've had our different meetings with law enforcement as well, like they also voice that like, we don't want to address these calls either because we don't feel like we have enough training or enough experience dealing with people that are having a mental break or that is drunk and disorderly or that, you know, so it's mm -hmm. that thing of we're all saying the same thing. It's just these mm -hmm. trigger words of defund or demand that makes um, certain people and certain professions get very defensive where it's no one's trying to take your job away from you. We're just making it so that you are more effective at what you're supposed to do for your job. <laughs> like it's like law enforcement yes. enforces oh, yes. the law enforces the law so yes that's when you start talking about it like bing, like we they you know it's in you different chats you read different articles you're like police don't like they don't they want to be police officers they want to be able to help someone that is in dire need or someone you know if there is a bankrupt like they that's what they i i would think that's what they went to the academy for they don't want to have to de-escalate someone that's having uh, a mental or emotional break when there's someone that's literally trained and down to do that, you know, like that's their wheelhouse. So anyway, that is off on a tangent. Go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> oh, and I, you know, I, I wanted to, to, I wanted to mention really quick, Tia, in the same regard, you mentioned like the demands language, people got so bent out of shape. You know, the sheriff got bent out of shape that we used the word demands. And I remember addressing that, like, okay, first of all, isn't that what you do? Like you demand that we, that we get out of the car. You demand that we show you the license. You demand that we put our hands up. You know, we're talking to you and you and your language. <laughs> and oh, second wow. of all, <laughs> you know, we're, we're taxpayers, right? We're taxpayers and we pay your salary. I had to remind the sheriff of that of our last meeting or one of our last meetings. He looked shocked for a minute. And, um, you know, of course we demand that you, that you reform. We're done talking. We're done, we're done being nice about it. People are getting killed, dude. Right, right. Yeah. Let's do it, let's do it. Let's, let's do it before we actually have like a serious need to have these things already in place. And Courtney is really good about reiterating that too in these meetings It's like, yeah, you may not think there's a, a demand for it or a need for it, but let's do it before there's, we have a George Floyd situation here. We have a Trayvon Martin situation here. We have, our, before we are, we become on the spot for something that is negative that could have been preventable. If we just rethought, restructured the way the system has been going. Cause the last 500 years or more, because again, this is not our land. That's not, that's not working. Let's, let's, we're not reinventing the wheel here. <laughs> so. and, and not to, to also point out that, you know, when people of color make demands, it suddenly becomes offensive, right? right. But we have Karen demanding to see the manager, you know, every day. And we, we and have people demand, we have people, issue. <laughs> we have people demanding not to wear masks, you know? So it's, it's not the fact of what I'm saying, it's who's saying it, right? Absolutely. And the, and yeah, the total historical attempt. value of you don't, it's hard to let a black woman tell you what you need to do, even though I pay, like Holly, Holly said, I pay your salary. I will be the angry black woman all day long if that gets stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> well, not just that, but it, it was also this, this whole like 
attempt to diminish our message, you know, by saying, oh, you can't talk to us like that. We're like, um, you know what, like, don't even fall for that stuff. You know, we, we see right through all of that. It was pretty, it was kind of comical, actually. I hate to say that, but just sad. Well, I mean, when you asked and asked and asked and you've been polite and you've tried to stay in your lane your whole life because you're seen as angry, you know, and, and you can't, you can't be angry and be a person of color. Um, yeah, I think it comes to a point where you feel like, yeah, I'm demanding this at this point now because you haven't been listening all of this time. So now we, we're at the point where it is a demand. But we're also talking about like, not all, but some law enforcement officers who are in it because they want to catch the bad guy. And to me, when I think of law enforcement in the community, I want somebody that I can come to that it feels safe um, and who is in this because they want to take care of their community. Not because they want to catch bad guys, but they want to be around and available before that even happens. So it doesn't happen. Like we don't have bad guys. We just treat each other res with respect and like dignity and take care of each other. But that's, that's just me. I, I don't speak for everyone. I speak for myself. And that's, that's the way I feel. Are we ready to move on to number three? I think that's where we are. No. And I was going to say, Courtney, I think you know that. So nope. I appreciate you. Thank I kind of want to go back to the whole de-escalation thing because I want to honor that law enforcement do receive training for de-escalation. Totally, 100%. However, social workers, we're prepared to like spend hours on de-escalation. Realistically, is that realistic for law enforcement to spend hours on one situation to de-escalate one person? No, it's really not, especially because, well, unfortunately, in the world we're living in, crime hasn't stopped. So it's like, are we going to expect law enforcement to drop everything and focus on one person having a mental mental breakdown? Um, no. So realistically, once again, more reasons to bring in social workers into these situations because we are able to spend an hour two hours, we're able to follow up with that individual. We're able to connect them to community resources. Like during our meetings with law enforcement, that's been like, as we've already talked about, like that's been the, the common wraparound. Like we always come back to, okay, but who could help in these situations? Like who in our community or what organization, agency, whatever could assist with this situation? And it's like, okay, if we're gonna continue to spend time doing that, like let's live it too. Like let's put it into practice. Like. Realistically, we all have different circles and areas of expertise, so let's put them to use. Well, I think that's what makes community community, right? Like we are depending on each other. We're taking care of each mm -hmm. other. And I, I can't think of a better way than to include people who are trained to do this every day, you know, to, to work on these matters of de-escalation. Absolutely. We need and to start working together and not like making this divide between right. us all. Right. And that too, like to piggyback on that thought, like when we have met with certain law enforcement or different law enforcement, the, the big thing that we're still trying to, to keep reiterating is that we're trying to make it safe for everyone, for you as law enforcement, and for us as community members, holding everyone accountable for their actions, whether that's with a new um, implicit bias training, your anti, you know, profiling policy or body cameras. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's to protect you and to protect us. It's all about, again, Courtney, it says it so well, of being a community like it shouldn't it shouldn't be this in <laughs> an ideal world
Okay. So number three is to establish an anti-profiling policy and procedure. The um, policy should be stating that it's prohibited and um, adopting best practices for 911 and police referral process. This is something that we are in the midst of. Um, Holly is working with uh, Noelle Mogenberg to get some language together for a profiling policy that makes sense for our community. Anyone wanna jump in on this? I had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so we're, yeah, that's something we're working on. We've been looking around for examples. Um, one of the thing, one of our challenges is that um, when we draft, you know, these policies, they have to both um, be easy enough for law enforcement to read and follow, right? Um, not that we think that they're, they, they're not intelligent or anything like that, um, but when, whenever you draft policy um, and as someone who's to help draft laws, you need to make something that has enough wiggle room to be subjective in the situations it needs to be and not objective in the situations that it needs to be. So for example, we don't want a, a policy out there that is um, going to allow for, for cops to blow through some loophole or some strange definition of a word that becomes subjective for them. So like, oh, it says color on here, but I'm colorblind, right? Or it says color on here and I don't recognize color, that sort of thing. So we need to, we need to make it explicit enough um, so that there's really no question about the intent of what those policies are and explicit enough to know what, what should or should not be happening um, but also subjective enough so that if a, an officer needs to make a decision to, to bring about a just result or a fair result in applying those policies, that they can do that. So, um, but that's gonna, that takes the input of, of all of these different agencies. So we have to work with um, the prosecuting attorney's office. We have to work with uh, both the city and county law enforcement officials. We have to work with 911. Um, and because they're, you know, the ones sending out the calls and have some, and they have some discretion in that. Um, but we've also um, contacted our state attorney general to see what, you know, what their input was and to see uh, sort of what's out there. And um, a lot of that takes some broad comparison so that we're not re rewriting the wheel. Um, I think what's really important is to see what's worked well. And that's actually hard to find right now. We haven't found too many um, well-written policies that are that have um, been in practice, which is shocking to me, honestly. So that's where we are with that. And I just wanna say that we are incredibly lucky to have Holly, who is a, an attorney, a judge, working on these things um, because it is complicated. It's complex, uh, it's nuanced, and it's, it's going to take a little bit of time to get through um, and get something that will be workable um, for, for us all here in the community. So thank you very much Yay. for working on Holly, that. Holly T-Bird, Holly, Holly, Holly. <laughs> I would say, you know what, to me, um, <laughs> if I didn't do this stuff, I couldn't sleep. You know, that's, that's just like the basis of it. I have children. You have children, um, Brianna has children, dogs, and just, you know, we have ourselves, we have siblings, we have grandparents, we have um, people around us, you know, I, I have in my own family, I have like every skin tone you can think of and genders and religions and orientations, you know, um, and I, I can't stand the thought of any, any of those people or any of our people um, being treated poorly for something that they can't help. You right, know, right. It doesn't, exactly. I can't sleep. So <laughs> I'm fortunate to be, to be lucky enough to have gotten the education and right. um, to be raised with, 
the ability to do that and the value in the education. So it's not, it's not fail safe because, um, you know, knowing the rules is good, knowing how to do this stuff is good, but you've got to be able to have the passion and the heart behind it to make it happen. So I thank all my ancestors and all of my inspiration. So, yes. Yeah. We have a we have a really awesome person named Alexis Marsh who has been commenting on our chat over here. Um, I want to I want to lift up some of these comments. Um, Alexis is saying this is so informative and thank you for sharing your perspective experiences and for creating this presentation. It is beyond necessary to discuss all of this. Um, she's also said the power of unity is undeniable. We cannot condone the injustice any longer. And so I wanna shout out to, to Alexis, thank you so much. It's um, great to have your, your allyship, um, your accompliceness, if you wanna call it that. <laughs> um, it's funny because Rachel Marco Havens and I had a really big discussion on allies and accomplices um, on Friday. And what does that mean? And um, maybe towards the end of this conversation, we can all talk a little bit about what that means to us. Cause I think that we all have some different perspectives, which is great. Um, and that sort of rounded way of looking at things, um, I think will be really helpful for, for this question. But, and then also Seth is sending his love um, from, he's in the, yeah, he's in his understanding racial justice class right now. They're on break and he just, he clicked over to, to check us out and said he's Sweet. sending love and gratitude, so. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send him a message. So I guess we're, um, we're, that was number three and we're going to number four. Is that right? Yeah, we're on number four. Yep. Number four is that the city and county um, have body cameras and dash cameras installed and have mandatory use. We want to divert funds from the current budget rather than increasing the police budget. Establish mandatory policy every officer wears a body camera to be left on at all times. Yep. Police officers shutting off cameras while on duty would should trigger immediate disciplinary action and shutting cameras off in a criminal incident should result in firing. Yep. So we're in the midst of that one right now. Um, the city um, has been demoing um, body cameras and the sheriff's department has just started. I think this past, or is about to start, I should say, um, demoing. They have been, uh, the sheriff's department has been working on putting together a, uh, a policy before trying to demo the body cameras. They thought that that would be a wise thing to do. Um, and so they haven't quite started demoing the body cameras, but they are about to do that, um, which is exciting and it is progress. So uh, before there was not really any movement on this and there was not a, yes, we support body cameras. Some people supported them, but getting the sheriff to say that, that was a recent development. And one, we were all like, Oh my God, <laughs> it finally happened. He said the words. He I can't believe yes. that. He said, yes. It's like saying yes to the dress. Oh my God. <laughs> right. Like and we, and we want to uplift that. Cause we it did take quite it. a while. Yeah. We want to uplift it. Cause it took a long time to get there. And um, while well, we felt like we were beating our heads against the wall for a while, you know, I have to shout out to um, any of the people involved that were actually pushing to make that happen as well. For real. Because we know that there were other people in the sheriff's department or in other parts of law enforcement or county, county organizational, you know, stuff that were pushing for that, uh -huh. you know, and, um, and we're kind of here laughing and giggling over it because it 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 was a lot of frustration for a while but a wild you know, ride. change isn't easy yeah and change isn't easy for some people yeah I, I want to acknowledge the fact too that like it may not seem like we're 
we haven't been giving a lot of updates because we've been in the midst of all of these things and we are working on that. We will be giving updates about what is happening uh -huh. to be transparent, but um, we are doing stuff. We are actively working and meeting with people every week. And if we're not meeting with someone, we're having discussions about what is our next step? Where do we right. go from here? putting together resources um, and information to present our case. So I know we have been not great about giving updates, but rest assured, like work is being done. Work is being so done. And um, we thank you all for, for riding with us. And like I said, we'll be putting out updates more frequently on what is actually taking place. Yeah, so, and it should I also know. be known too. Like I will say, since the Ju since the June rally, when Courtney, excuse me, when Courtney gave the demands, Courtney has, and we all have been meeting where we can, and especially with the pandemic and COVID, and trying to do a Zoom and trying to meet in person and trying to do this. Um, Courtney has been like our front runner as far as getting those meetings established too with Sheriff Bensley, with uh, Chief O'Brien when that was like a hot thing for a second. Um, and and really being that that liaison between the two the two groups, if you will, and staying and staying on it and reminding us like, hey, we gotta meet like let's let's <laughs> let's keep it going because it can, like Holly said, it kind of felt like we were doing this for a while. And it can also, and, and, and let's not forget that the body cameras was not a thing that we initially like brought to the table, like a brand new thing for Traverse City. Like it's been mentioned years past, but it's never gotten come to full, full view, I guess is the best word. And it's not something that's not even, that's not happening nationwide. Like it's, we're not the only state in our nation that has body cameras and that implements them and that has caught people either trying to lie on the police or the, you know, like it's, it's helping people, it's helping law enforcement and communities from both sides of the, of the spectrum. So I just want to say that, you know, to give a thank you to Courtney too. And, and all, you know, all of us have been working and doing what we can for these meetings, but the ongoing and keeping it so it, it doesn't fade away, you know, and it's, it's definitely a, a process and it's good that, you know, Sheriff Bensley did finally on video say yes. So we're glad for those nudgers that were helping get getting that to happen. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> now we're just working. How many times, Cordy? It's a yes or no question. question. <laughs> We're not inventing the wheel. That's where I love, like when she said that, I was like, yes, girl, we're not, we're not. It's not, and that's the thing of like, it's not, it shouldn't be something that take is taken as an offense that we want you to have a body camera on. Like if there's nothing that you should, you shouldn't be worried about anything. If it's, it's to keep everybody protected. It's not, we're not gonna throw up these like, weird possibilities of why you would turn it off or you don't want to hear people to hear you singing on the radio like whatever dude just we're all gonna wear our cameras and it's gonna be great we have can't i mean that's how we we live our life we're constantly being recorded whether you're at the grocery store or you ran a red light or you're at home you know on tiktok like we're we're a generation of constantly having things on video for to go back and to document and to go back and reference so why would our law enforcement be any different in that, in that thought process, in my opinion, so. Well, and let's just be real, like the statistics show that 90% of the time police officers aren't doing the wrong thing, right? So shouldn't be, shouldn't be worried about it. If that's, that's the statistic. So I don't, I don't think we, it, it should just be a thing, right? It should just yeah. be. A standard, we, well, and it shows that it cuts, do, cuts down on the number of police complaints, complaints right. against police because yeah. it exon it's like an immediate exoneration. Yeah, for those those officers that are not doing anything wrong, and at right. the same time, it brings down the number of court cases. Yes, because 
people, you know, we have video evidence of things happening and that inspires a plea or, you know, something that cuts mm-hmm. down on, on the labor of the court process. So it, it helps everybody. It helps, <laughs> it helps everyone. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's like Courtney said, it's, it's definitely hasn't died off. It's just a literally a constant process. We keep, as Brianna says, we, we're, we're still press and play, press play. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so going uh, into the next thing here, County Sheriff's Department provides biannual implicit bias training. We acknowledge and support the city police's implicit bias training. We call on the sheriff to support his officers and staff by providing immediate and annual implicit bias training. Um, This should be mandatory for all law enforcement officers, both city and county, with a training program that is selected by um, BIPOC, so Black Indigenous People of Color, um, the the task force. So um, this is something that we are working with them on as well um, currently, and both the city and the county have gone through implicit bias training. things that they had already had scheduled, but we have talked with them about ongoing training because it's not something that is like a one and done. It is not something where you spend three hours learning and then it's like, peace, we did our thing. It's not that. Um, Every one of us has implicit bias. Every one of us. It's ongoing. And it's something that we have to we should be, we should be training on all the time. We should be talking about these things. We should be listening to each other and and having an open mind. Um, So yeah, so we're working with them right now uh, to take a course through title track, working on an implicit bias training specifically geared towards law enforcement officers, which I think starts in October, right? Holly, is that starting for the city in October? That's right. That's right. And we have, um, it's my understanding there were some that might be starting in January too. So um, I'm not sure exactly which cohort is which, but yeah, I agree with your comments is, you know, with title track um, and, and through the, the wonderful supervision of Elizabeth Wolf and Seth Bernard, um, who are, you know, both have training in this. um, They, it's shown that it's a lot less effective to do like a a three hour course over the computer, you know, like, which is what uh, I think it was, Sheriff Bensley was their their first proposed implicit bias training. And, um, you know, there's, you need face-to-face contact, whether it's by Zoom or in person, you need to be able to ask questions. You need real life examples. And it needs to be, it, there's such an internal change there that needs to happen that people, it's a healing. You know, it's a healing of the internal self. And um, that doesn't happen in three hours. It doesn't even happen overnight. You know, it's going to take some while to internalize those changes and to make it a practice. So um, part of what we, you know, what we found was most effective was doing the five weeks. And that, to to me, that's kind of a minimum. You know, five weeks is a minimum. Um, Ideally, you would go on from there and, and continue with that work on a on a weekly daily basis to some degree and then um but for law enforcement you know that was our proposal is don't don't just do this on the spot thing this needs to be uh something that happens often something that happens on a continuing basis something that happens every year you know it can't just be one big training for everybody or you you got hired so you have to get trained here for a day (laughs) it just doesn't make any sense so, and, and that goes along with the changes in the policies too. It's, I think it's really hard for people to um, to want to change their own policies if they, they don't know what we're talking about. You know, if they haven't internalized that practice yet. So um, it's, it's pretty essential to making these changes and to actually implementing them. So, yeah. 
Okay. Number six. Next one. Yep. Number six. End racist ICE CBP holds. The Sheriff's Department should halt ICE and CBP holds of nonviolent people detained by police, like local police, a practice that is believed to be unconstitutional and is totally voluntary current practice. Do not call ICE CBP when stopping Latinx people in our community. So we would like that to happen and that there is a transparent budget breakdown for the Sheriff's Department, which is 40% of the mill, um, 40 mil budget that the Sheriff Office has within, well, we've already passed that time period, but time limits. I, yeah, and I do wanna bring up with respect to the ice holds, you know, not everybody knows that those holds are voluntary on behalf of our local law enforcement. They do not have to hold people for ICE. They don't have to hold people to get deported. They can release them and make ICE do their own job. Right? So what value does our law enforcement have in going after our, our immigrant families? And that, cause that's what they're doing. And a lot of these people have lived here for their whole lives, some of them for years and years and years. And I, I can't tell you how many families I've seen torn up by this. And it could be for the smallest thing. Like someone had a, a traffic ticket and therefore their application for status was held up. You know, this is, we're not talking like major criminals, you know, or the, the rapists and drug dealers that, that, um, President Trump has talked about. These are people that have lived here for a long time and, and are established families. So, um, you know, and, unless people in law enforcement are supporting a political agenda, um, as well as the racism be behind that agenda, and we're talking about the same agenda that's caging children and is now performing um, uh, unapproved or unconsented to sterilizations of women, immigrant women coming over the border. Um, that's what they're supporting. So we want that to stop, you know, and as a, I'm, I'm of Mexican descent, my grandmother came from Mexico and, um, you know, I have other relatives that are actually from England. My mom was first generation from England and uh, some of the relatives I have on that side of the family support these these immigration <laughs> policies, and I just go, "Wow, you know, like what if this was happening? What if, what if Grandma had come over as a result of um, trying to get away from a, an abusive person, or or something worse, you know, or or even just came over wanting a better life, and um, this had happened to her? I mean, what what would it have made it any difference? But we know historically, and we know factually even now that it's people of color, people with brown skin that are being treated this way. So we don't hear of, of the same struggles on the Canadian border at all. So um, yeah, we, we stand by that and, and demand that from our law enforcement that they don't perpetuate that politic, that racist politic. No, that's really, really important. You know, I don't, I still just don't understand why we can't treat people like people. You know, we all are human, but all right. Number seven, realign the budget priorities <clears throat> toward proactive community support. The sheriff's department budget is 40% of the county's general budget fund budget. 40%, y'all, 40%. That's a lot. 30% uh, is considered high for municipalities nationally to spend on law enforcement. Work with black and other um, brown indigenous people of color to realign general fund budget to divert 15% of the sheriff budget to non-policing community health and safety issues. So this speaks to like the, the resource referrals that we were talking about, putting some of that money that the sheriff's department currently receives 
towards hiring people or you know even just like there are, there are, we're working with these community organizations already right so let's put some more funds into working with them so that they they can do the job that's needed and actually will be assisting to a greater extent law enforcement it only makes sense at least to me it makes sense i don't know all Inside. right yeah <laughs> Well, and I think the Number important thing we found is that even with that budget, they were there was hardly anything going to vets. There was hardly anything going to families or mental health or homelessness in that budget, in that same county budget. And 40% of it was going to the cops. And we were like, what? Yeah. What is it's like pennies that goes to everything else. When you look at the budget, it's like pennies that go to all of the other resources that we have. It's, it's mind blowing, really. All right, eight, commitment from police unions not to protect membership who engage in criminal behavior towards people in their custody. Huge. Yeah. I can and think of a case. <laughs> well, we remember when we spoke to Attorney General Nessel the other, the other week and she talked about how there is no accountability for officers you know police unions back them up there's no law in place that allows us to to unseat them you know or to, to even hold them accountable absent trying to file a lawsuit against them which has a super high bar um, to get past to find them accountable for things um, and then there was also the idea that um, you know, we know of police officers that might get, that might do something, um, have a really poor performance or do something bad, you know, within the, the course of their duties and their, um, their bosses will let them resign or transfer so they don't lose their pensions. And then yeah. when they transfer to the other, to the other, um, to somewhere else, or they get a job somewhere else, their records don't necessarily follow them. And so people it's don't even know who they're getting, <laughs> you know, and that's insane. That doesn't happen anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, if you were to like translaterally move within your organization, your records follow you, but in police and law enforcement, that doesn't happen. And that is incredibly mind blowing to me it's scary it's scary and that's where you have those those hiccups if you will in the system where people do have these violent records or have these records that have um them interacting with people of color more harshly than any other group and they just get moved or they're being inappropriate with whoever or misusing you know taxpayer funds they just get moved to a different department and that doesn't that whole background is like almost expunged it's it doesn't it doesn't matter um and again that's uh, it's all about accountability if we as 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 tax paying citizens we have to always be held accountable to pay our taxes to get our license renewed to make sure if we go for a new job they check background check they references like if we are all held to this certain standard why are we stopping with law enforcement? Why are we not holding them just as accountable or even more because their job, they do have a dangerous job. They do, there is liability with them going out and putting, you know, their, their badge on and their bulletproof rest. Like that's a, that's a part of the job. So you should be held at a higher standard because of what you are doing. <laughs> they carry weapons of deadly force. Yes. They, they should be under the highest standard. Yep. <laughs> anyway we all agree on that for sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> next <laughs> number nine established establish and fund from the sheriff and city police budget an in, independent citizen oversight commission with membership being human rights commission representatives civil rights attorneys as well as a majority of at-large black and other brown indigenous people of color 
and other marginalized constituencies such as disability, LGBTQ+, and migrant workers. Budget should provide for infrastructure to allow proper oversight. Police cannot and should not investigate themselves. The commission should act as a review for complaints and refer to the attorney general or civil rights commission as needed. Again, I mean, it only makes sense to bring everybody to the table, right? And police officers should not be investigating themselves. I think that's just abundantly clear. Well, I mean, it's like it's you don't have about, a child about a con like conflict of interest. Like it's just it's how are you going to properly investigate someone that is your I don't I don't know what the best word is your your friend or your your but your brother in blue. Like how are you again going to be held? Uh, how are they going to be held accountable? if you don't bring in an outside source to come with a different view of the situation and it get treated fairly, how is it going to be fair? It makes no sense. It, it makes no sense. And it's funny. That's one of the, that's one of the demands that we got like eye rolls on, like immediately I noticed, you know, like people oh, yeah. don't oh, yeah. like that idea. Oh, God forbid someone, you know, judge us. Yeah. Well, it goes back to that whole, like, that whole demand theory we were talking, you were talking about Holly, like mm -hmm. when you use that same language with them, which that's your whole job is to demand actions for someone else. So you can feel safe to do your job. Why would, why are you above that? Like, it's, it's just accountability and it's, so your job can be effective too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Well, and this is where police unions have sort of painted this solid brick wall around around cops, you know, under the guise of saying we need protection because we have this dangerous job. And none of us disputes that. None of us mm -hmm. says that cops shouldn't have protection. None of us says that um, they we shouldn't be looking out for them. Right. You know, we have those people that say, oh, they but they asked for it. That's the job they signed up for. I don't subscribe to that. I want everybody to have safe work, working conditions, right? However, um, that doesn't mean immune <laughs> from any kind of oversight, right. right? Especially when you're carrying around dangerous weapons and, you know, people are getting killed. People are getting arrested. You're depriving people of their liberty, right? So yeah, the true meaning of liberty, not like I have to wear a mask and you're taking my liberty and my rights away. This is like, for real, for real. <laughs> Sorry, had to plug that in. I know, I know. <laughs> well, we could talk those, hours about that. Yeah, to those people, I say, I don't think they really know what losing liberty means. They're privileged, you know? To them, that means I don't have, I, I'm losing my liberty because I have to wear a mask during a pandemic to keep other people safe. Right, okay, right. you know. Sorry, I just went off the rails. That's, sorry, go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> like nobody take their cappuccino away from them, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Sorry. <laughs> Here we I'm go. Resting entirely, let's be loving and good. <laughs> All right, this is the last <laughs> of the 10 demands but this is not the last of the things that we would like to see changed. Cause there are a lot mm. of things I think that we would like to see changed, but these are starters, right? This is like, yes. these are things that should already be happening. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we, we just want to make them happen. So last one, all anti-racist Grand Traverse County and city residents pledge to act in an ongoing way on these demands. Plant, pledge to stand with black and pe brown indigenous people of color, our neighbors in this community by vigorously pursuing these policy changes with your elected and appointed sheriff and chief of police, police unions, city and county commissions until they are all in place and properly funded. So please y'all, if you are watching, 
if you are listening, please continue to support what we are asking for and go to your city and county commission meetings. It is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Things happen at city and county commission meetings that directly affect you. They directly affect your neighbors. Please go to these meetings. If you can't go, you can watch them. They are online. But it is incredibly important to be informed on what is happening here because there are policies and procedures that are being put into place that probably are not serving you. And you can have them serve you if mm -hmm. you are involved. And it yeah. is important to be involved. Yes. Say it louder for the people in the back, Courtney. <laughs> we need all hands on deck. We need all everyone hands on deck. Involved. We want and this also, to be an inclusive and, you know, this is not just about people of color. This is about everyone. This is about everyone. Mm -hmm. So, oh, that's what I got to say. And then also to, um, kind of piggyback on that with the demands there you can view them also on our Facebook page but also since the body cameras is something that is ongoing and it's not the last thing that we want to keep working with um, law enforcement whoever gets uh, you know elected or whatever may happen in November email them call them as a community let them know what you want them to do for you with your taxpayer dollars. And um, I don't know if Courtney can, but we can put in the, I, I don't know if it's, I mean, you can Google it, but emailing Sheriff Bensley, giving him a phone call, letting him know that you completely support not just the body cams demand, but all the 10 demands that were listed at the June rally and CC us um, as well in that email. So just so we are, we are aware and know, we have to start beating down these doors and calling and emailing off the hook until it, I mean that the, the the outcry and demands is how we get the protesting is how things get done that's how people resign that's how people get fired that's you know that's how people get their justice served is because the community has to fight because it's we control that that's our that's our money those are elected officials this is our community. So keep calling, keep emailing, keep pushing, 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 press play. I wanna, I wanna give a shout out to all of our supporters because that was one of the most amazing things. I mean, even from the first protest when 2000 people showed up, I mean, I, I know that you guys, we all felt teary, you know, when we were up on that stage um, sort of directing this protest and, and talking, it was very emotional. And um, I know I felt that way even when I went to Standing Rock when fully half of our camp was non-native, you know, out of 20,000 people. And um, that was amazing, you know, and, it was, and I had the same feeling here. And, and then all of these people that have called in during commission meetings, during um, city, city meetings, um, sending in letters. We have people that are putting ads out um, various acts, various acts, various words. Um, some people have really stepped up and we, we see you and we appreciate you. And I just want to say that, you know, from our hearts, that's, um, I, I know that there are people that say we shouldn't thank you for doing something that should have been done already, like back in the sixties, but I, I don't believe that. I think good work, um, should always be recognized and, I'm, I'm thankful to all those people. Miigwech, miigwech, miigwech. Um, so with that, that being said, it's, we kind of already touched on how our community can, can show up is the, the call to actions, being on the Facebook page, emailing, going to your commissioner's meeting, going to your township meetings, just being involved as, as involved as you can be from the lowest local level and, and knowing exactly 
who you're voting for, what you're voting for, what your area is trying to do, what the people that are elected already are trying to do for your area. Be as involved and um, vocal as possible. Uh, I don't know if we want to touch on how we how we do how we use E three in our lives, which um, for the I don't think, I don't know if, I don't know if we touched on this, but E three um, stands for elevate engage and oh, I'm blanking elevate engage educate whoo almost lost it <laughs> I got it um and that's for everybody in our community and I how I am trying to use those three e's and kind of building different relationships that I didn't realize that I had in this community to furthermore show the inclusiveness and, and the diversity that needs to be shown here in Traverse City. You know, we're, we're a big tourist area, but we also, you know, people want to, people want to live here. It's beautiful. We're by the water and, you know, this and that, but you have to, you have to create a community where people want to, want to stay and feel welcome to stay. So I, have been talking to more people than I feel like I would have talked to in the last 10 years, almost 10 years that we've been here and um, using what I know to further educate people, not only of how to be anti-racist, but how to further educate yourself and, the, and your family. And um, yeah, if anybody else wants to talk on that. <laughs> I, I agree with that entirely, Tia, and thank you so much for, for reviewing that um, about E3. Some people don't know, you know, how why we changed our name aside from it being clunkier. Uh, we wanted to ease it up, but also we wanted to include those, those elements. Um, and I have to thank Marshall Collins, one of our council members, for bringing that to us, um, the E3 message to engage, elevate, and educate. Um, I have to reflect back on that sometimes, like when I start to get angry or I wanna, I wanna um, get negative in my response, that even just the name brings me back to, to why we're here, which is to use love and education to the best of our ability and to treat people respectfully um, in this work so that we're modeling the behavior that we wanna, we wanna see. Um, and I think that, uh, all of those words, all of those things that you're, you just talked about, Tia, um, and all of those ways that we can do things, you know, are, are really helpful. So, yeah, E3 all over the place, everyone. Doesn't, it doesn't apply just to our council, but to everybody, you know, that, yeah. that is doing this work. And it also applies to, to again, to with our community and businesses and how businesses can step up and not only... Um, demand different changes for their community at large, but also stand up and, and take a reflection of how their business reacts to things and how they treat their employees and how they deal with people that do feel discriminated against. How are you taking action and making that person feel? Are you, do you have training in place for that? Do you have, what does your HR look like when you do have someone that voices their feeling you know, discriminated against? Do you throw it under the rug or do you approach, like it's now it's an, it's activating every strain of our different systems here in education. How are we reacting to situations in school when kids are feeling discriminated against? How is your administration trained to deal with that? Um, and that's really important. Have businesses having an anti-racism uh, policy and something in play like there's got we've got it doesn't just stop at the protest it's like now and we're talking about restructuring systems right breaking down old things burning them down now when we restructure it how do we want that structure to look and um, that's the beauty of e32 is opening the doors where you're on these different committees and talking to these different groups of people where you bring that those things to light and currently right now, not only with, I'm with E3, but I also am a committee member of Traverse City Connects um, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. So it's trying to figure out how 
those things can meld together and you want to have an inclusive place where people not only want to visit, but also want to live and able to, to make a living a living wage for them and their family. And so if, if we include businesses, we have to include businesses. We have to, we have to have, we have to change the mindset of what are, what are you doing to keep your, not only your community safe, but your employees? What does that look like? Exactly. I'm sorry, go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> I was just going to say too, like, you know, businesses have anti-discrimination policies in place, right? Most every place I've ever been hired has a policy, but it gets this much. And then the follow through is, is where things just go sideways, you know, like, I, I've found that in, in my in my life, when I report these things to employers, it's just kind of like you're being a little over dramatic or okay, we'll look into that. You they have a conversation and then nothing happens and then the behavior is still there. So for business owners to really step up and say, we will not tolerate this kind of behavior and we won't tolerate it not only with our employees, but we won't tolerate it from customers either, which I think is also really, really important. So having something posted in your business that says, this is what our policy is for our employees. And this is the behavior that we expect from customers here. You know, we have no shirt, no, no shoes, no service. Well, Maybe we also need to be thinking about how we interact as humans. So if you are not treating each other with respect, see ya, bye. You know, you don't need to be here. That's no just shirt. the way that I feel. No shirt, no shoes, no racism, wear masks. <laughs> all right. Yeah, New you know, thing. you see the signs all over the place of we believe we need to have something like that in businesses right. that we believe in, in our business community. And just yeah. as people, I mean, it really comes down to let's treat everyone with dignity. Let's treat everyone as human beings, yeah. our brothers and sisters. And then also too, not just businesses, but when as, as, um, community members, when you are at a business and you do see something that goes down that you know that is not right, doesn't feel good in your soul, it's say something. Be the person that's like, hey, don't, you know, not the video people that just let the stuff happen and transpire and there's no, there's no type of interjection. People that will call it out and then let the, let the owner or the manager or put these people pe put businesses and community members on notice that you know that behavior is not is is not tolerated in our community too and i was going to say courtney just to reference the signs you were talking about the the we believe signs are ones that are kind of present here in northern michigan where they they talk about we believe that love is love etc cetera, etc cetera. um it's not, they're not signs that, you know, we believe in aliens or Jesus or whatever it is. These are specific to, um, you know, uplifting BIPOC and LGBTQ communities and things like that. So there's, there's some really cool signs out there that I really love. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is, and, and these are to our allies, you know, even if you think you're open and, and not racist, it takes positive loud action to make this true and to make your, your workplace your home, your community, inclusive, you know, and it's just like what Tia is saying, post something, you know, have expectations for people who walk near you or around you. Um, I myself have had, you know, one of my ex-husband's relatives came over and um, was having dinner at our house and started in on some racist tirade. Of course, he didn't know, you know, my background. He didn't know my attitudes and it really didn't matter if he did. I kicked him out of my house because I said, that's not allowed here. And he never came back again. So um, that's the kind of attitude, you know, I had back then, I might try a little harder to, to engage him in, into some education, 
now than I did back then. But um, that doesn't, it still doesn't mean it's okay. So that's, I love that idea. You know, you have to activate, you have to be strong, you have to be brave and and take a stand on something. Um, If you don't, you're letting it happen. And also those, those conversations, I've had many conversations with family where it's, it's, it's hard. It's rough. It is really rough. And it's like almost just as just depressing as, as everything else that's coming down on us. Right. But the thing that I've noticed, and this will kind of like segue us into like our last portion that we're going to talk about is that realizing that you can educate and you can elevate and you can engage people as much as you want. But sometimes that like that separation of where you know it's not we're not going to agree and we're not going to come to a common ground the self-care of it is detaching yourself from that situation right for me it was if I can if I need to be of the right mind and of the right spirit then I have that's my self-care and self-care is not always like taking a shower by yourself or it could be or taking a bath but it's it I feel like self-care now is just so it's so many things, you know? So I'm kind of curious what you, you other ladies have been doing for self-care because especially in this in this line of work, which I'm realizing within the last couple of months, like we said, after the protest, we kind of just hit the ground running and haven't stopped. It's so important to stop for a second and and take care of you because you've read the stories of people that are true activists that get sick they let like the the news of the heaviness of everything it starts to make you sick from the inside out so we really um with our council have been really good about checking each other too like hey you can take a break (laughs) if you feel like you need to take some time and I feel like we all have to do that so I'm curious of what you guys have been doing the same self-care things or have you elevated how you're how you're self-caring I think that self-care is super important for resilience, which is the theme of this this year's Harvest Gathering, um, especially in the face of a pandemic and just the whole shitstorm that's been thrown out <laughs> this year. Um, it's uh, how do you do that, you know? And I think we're all very fortunate to grow up in a place and a time where even though all this stuff has happened, even leading up to this, we've all been safe and fed and um, educated and, you know, walk, walking around in a somewhat free place. Um, So we're not, we're not really used to this yet. And I, and I think of people living in other places where that's not the case. You know, there are children living under bombs right now. There are children living um, in places of famine and, um, and, and, you know, my heart goes out to all of the, all of those people. So how, what do we do to self-care during this time when we feel like, oh, you know, all this is happening. Reality is hitting us like crazy. And um, of course, it, it always helps to have a great community around you. You know, you reach out for those people that are supportive. And I'm always grateful for the people that are here. Um, the, um, I'm, I'm grateful too that I've, I've, um, been able to sort of pull back from my travels and, and exploration and job stuff out in the larger United States uh, community to be home in a, in a more supportive place. Um, <clears throat> it's important for us to, to take time to grieve and to process and to rely on our medicines or our um, what, we, what we use for faith you know, in, in our, in our world and, and to, um, to really dig deep within ourselves for that, that resilience. But I'm also thankful, we, you know, this is part of where we live. I mean, we can all get out in the sunshine. We can all get out in the, in the natural world and um, whether we're walking our dogs or taking a, a swim at the beach or walking through the woods, we have this beautiful area to sort of go de-stress and that was um, one of the biggest tools that I learned from my elders um, who have faced way more than I have was the minute you start feeling depressed or sad, do something. You know, it was always do something like first smudge off 
and then say some prayers and go do something. So it could have been um, just moving yourself from your space, you know, moving yourself from your space and whether it's to take a jog to the mailbox or what, but doing something to change that mindset and, and sort of the sitting there of whatever your emotion is in. So um, that's, that's what I do, but I also spend a lot of time with my kids and um and rely on my my native uh faith and heritage for that so and then sometimes we call and complain to each other (laughs) and get support (laughs) it's true we do we do do that and i think that's really healthy that we're able to do that that we can trust each other and rely on each other and be in community with each other. I think that's incredibly important. Um, And so I do those things. Um, I have my son and I like to try to go for walks with him. It's like Holly had mentioned, like nature is such a healing source and um, I draw energy and recharge from, from being out in the air and close to the water. That's really important to me. That's always been a touchstone for me is like hearing that, hearing the waves and, and just doing that. So, and just immersing myself in water, um, um, music, sorry, <laughs> in music um, and art. So those are things that are important to me. I think Brianna had to go. Oh, we lost her. Yeah. But um, yeah, before we end, um, we definitely want to, we hope that this, um, this talk was beneficial and also really emphasizing that we all should be taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others um, and, and, and empower other people and fuel yourself first with love and care and grace before you can you can dish it out so if anybody has anything else they want to add to that i'm just grateful to be a part of e3 and have all of these wonderful people um supporting and uplifting each other and um the community that we are a part of And that's not just Northern Michigan. I mean, we're seeing changes across the country and I'm grateful for all of those things. So thank you. Thank you. Holly, you have any words? I'm thankful for everyone. I'm thankful for all the help. Um, I'm, I'm actually posting resources, recommended resources in the chat right now for people. And, um, I have to kind of piece that in, but, um, yeah, just grateful to be part of a, of a good and loving community that, that's wanting to do this work. Um, shout out to all of our local organizations and people that are investing and, and helping us do the work. Um, one thing that I, that I noticed that all, every single one of us could be doing this as a full-time job right now, and there's like 10 of us on the council. So yeah. Um, not that everybody would want to, but that's how much work we've been doing lately. And we couldn't do that without support. We couldn't do that without um, inspiration. And so shout out to all those people that have donated. You two can donate to E3 and our work, um, help us to move forward. I know all of us, some of us were talking about um, undergoing training for being racial, understanding racial justice trainers. Um, We can always use help with that. So if anybody wants to donate, uh, you can you can go to the title track webpage and donate under the Northern Michigan E3 um, donation section, and we would appreciate anything you could do. Don't mean to bring in that big plug here, but we forgot to mention it before. And thank you to any of our donors from before. So um, thank you to we the, we the people of Michigan who has um, helped us out as well, helping us with some internal work, uh, provided a fellowship for Courtney. And um, thank you to um, Rotary Charities for helping out with the understanding racial justice. Um, Thank you for all the people that are, um, there's so many I can't even name right now, but we look forward to to, um, advancing 
this work with your help. Also, thank you to the Harvest Gathering for inviting me and for letting us speak and kind of go off on our little tangents. It's been nice to <laughs> to 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 be with each other in this way in this in this community. So thank you for having us, and we hope that you all have a great and restful Sunday. Yes, thank you. And and that's one thing I want to shout out to Seth. I know that, that his heart's in all of this, and it has been for a very long time. So um, big kudos to, to everybody at Harvest Gathering for, for doing all the work that you do. We love you.